it's time for the Bill Ferguson Show. This is Phil Ferguson, and you are listening to The Phil Ferguson Show. Well, I've survived three and a half hours of fuckery this morning because I did a Windows update and an Audacity update, but I couldn't record. Audacity wouldn't work, so I tried to uninstall and reinstall. Uh, I uninstalled the Windows update. That broke some other things. Uh, went through a lot of steps, finally tried putting in some old, old fashioned, timey, wimey, uh, you know, earbuds, uh, plugged them into the, uh, headphone jack of the computer. And apparently the computer has an additional little bit of audio control panel and played around with that. And I was able to get sound again. So that was cool, but audacity still didn't work. <laughs> Cause I'd uninstalled it and windows didn't work right. So I had to reinstall the windows update, reinstall audacity, reboot a couple of times. And it looks like for now you can hear this recording. Everything is working. So fingers crossed that, uh, we move forward without any other future problems. I did get a couple of emails asking about the bonus audio that is within the last couple episodes of the show and the, the uh, writer, the author of those speeches is Robert Green Ingersoll. It is a audio recording produced by the Center for Inquiry and you can find it in their store. The title of it is Two CD Set Download Lectures by Ingersoll. I believe you can buy the disc, but once you buy the disc, like I said, it's $12. Uh, once you buy it, you can download the audio, I think. I haven't retried it, but this is something I bought years and years ago. And maybe four or five years ago, I put it in the show and just came to my mind that I haven't played these sound clips in a long time. So I'm putting those in. There's still more in this show and maybe one or two more episodes. But um, that is Robert Green Ingersoll as read by... A famous, no wait, see, they said a, a noted Shakespearean actor and director recorded in full digital fidelity. Digital fidelity, you know, you know what that's like. That is absolutely fantastic. Coming up in this show, I have a segment about the problems with winning the lottery. Talked about it before, been a while, but uh, in this case, uh, there's been an update and a story. And the reason it came to my attention is because a listener sent it to me, but they really liked the fact that not only did they have some troubles with the lottery winnings and, and how to spend it, they actually did a fairly reasonable job. The big part of this story was that they hired an advisor that put all the money into annuities. And you're going to hear all about that in that segment. So I don't want to ruin it. Another segment on long-term capital gains and tax rates. It is something that comes up from time to time, and the gist of that segment is that to rebalance, if you have to rebalance in a taxable account, you have to sell from the item that most likely did the best and take some of that money and put it in places that hasn't done the best. So that's what that topic is all about. And so before we get into all that stuff, of course, contemporary news, uh, Kamala Harris is now embarrassing Trump at every term. Apparently, he refuses to debate with her, which makes him look weak and a coward. Uh, the quote I came up with, and I'm sure other people have thought of this as well, is orange is the new yellow. <laughs> I thought that was cute. Uh, and uh, just all kinds of things going on. Uh, this whole thing about her being a DEI hire. Um, for those people who claim that, uh, that is a 
very, very nasty way of discounting someone's life work, in this case, Kamala Harris, and you are either a misogynist or racist or both. So knock it off. Don't, don't do that. Uh, the Olympics are going and we've had some fun stories there, which I'm not going to dwell on. Uh, but the one that's been great fun is the whole last supper, not last supper debacle and Christians getting their undies all in a bunch or clutching their pearls, whatever metaphor you want to throw in there. But the uh, opening ceremonies had a lot of cool things and special effects. And at some point they had a bunch of people sitting around a table partying and it's more to do with Dionysus and or uh, other Greek gods having festivals and drunkenness and parties and lots of food and wine while you still can because it's winter. So uh, if anything, Christianity stole from that shit and copied that because it was the theme that was popular 1500, 1800 years ago. The other thing that's hysterical is that the most famous Last Supper painting that was painted by Da Vinci, I can't remember the name of the church that it's in. It, of course, it's in Italy. The church and the monks that lived in the building at that time placed so little value on that painting that the monks actually damaged it by putting a door in the wall that the painting was on, damaging part of the painting, destroying, removing part of the painting because it was more important to them to get from one room to the other through this new door than to save the painting. And of course, the painting had become very faint and discolored and it's been worked on and touched up and now that building is under environmental control because it's a tourist hotspot. So wasn't really even a significant thing above many other things, but when Christians saw something like their thing, even though their thing, the Last Supper, copied the other thing, they went all cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, uh, claiming that they're offended and this is evil. And I saw one person shared it and showed that this was uh, the devil's work. And then, of course, I asked them, why did they share it if it's the devil's work? Are they working for the devil? That apparently was not appreciated. But, you know, it's the world I live in. So we're going to take a quick break. You'll probably hear more readings of Robert Green Ingersoll's speeches. And I hope you enjoy that. And then we'll go into the segments. And then, of course, wrap up the show uh, 40, 45 minutes from now. Talk to you then. Here. Section 8. The Philosophy of Christ Millions assert that the philosophy of Christ is perfect, that he was the wisest that ever uttered speech. Let us see. Resist not evil. If smitten on one cheek, turn the other. Is there any philosophy, any wisdom in this? Christ takes from goodness, from virtue, from the truth, the right of self-defense. Vice becomes the master of the world, and the good become the victims of the infamous. No man has the right to protect himself, his property, his wife and children. Government becomes impossible, and the world is at the mercy of criminals. Is there any absurdity beyond this? Love your enemies. Well, is this possible? Did any human being ever love his enemies? Did Christ love his when he denounced them as whited sepulchres, hypocrites, and vipers? We cannot love those who hate us. Hatred in the hearts of others does not breed love in ours. Not to resist evil is absurd. To love your enemies is impossible. Take no thought for the morrow. The idea was that God would take care of us as he did of sparrows and lilies. Is there the least sense in that belief? Does God take care of anybody? Can we live without taking thought for the morrow? To plow, to sow, to cultivate, to harvest, is to take thought for the morrow. We plan and work for the future, for our children, for the unborn generations to come. Without this forethought, there could be no progress, no civilization. The world would go back to the caves and dens of savagery. If thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out. If thy right hand offend thee, cut it off. Why? 
because it is better that one of our members should perish than the whole body should be cast into hell. Is there any wisdom in putting out your eyes or cutting off your hands? Is it possible to extract from these extravagant sayings the smallest grain of common sense? Swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is his holy city. Here we find the astronomy and geology of Christ. Heaven is the throne of God, the monarch. The earth is his footstool, a footstool that turns over at the rate of a thousand miles an hour and sweeps through space at the rate of over a thousand miles a minute. Where did Christ think heaven was? Why was Jerusalem a holy city? Was it because the inhabitants were ignorant, crude, and superstitious? If any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. Is there any philosophy, any good sense in that commandment? Would it not be just as sensible to say, If a man obtains a judgment against you for one hundred dollars, give him two hundred? Only the insane could give or follow this advice. Think not, I come to send peace on earth. I come not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother. If this is true, how much better it would have been had he remained away. Is it possible that he who said, Resist not evil, came to bring a sword? That he who said, Love your enemies, came to destroy the peace of the world? To set father against son, and daughter against father? What a glorious mission! He did bring a sword, and the sword was wet for a thousand years with innocent blood. In millions of hearts he sowed the seeds of hatred and revenge. He divided nations and families, put out the light of reason, and petrified the hearts of men. And every one that hath forsaken house, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive an hundredfold, and shall inherit everlasting life. According to the writer of Matthew, Christ the compassionate, the merciful, uttered these terrible words. Is it possible that Christ offered the bribe of eternal joy to those who would desert their fathers, their mothers, their wives, and children? Are we to win the happiness of heaven by deserting the ones we love? Is a home to be ruined here for the sake of a mansion there? And yet it is said that Christ is an example for all the world. Did he desert his father and mother? He said, speaking to his mother, Woman, what have I to do with thee? The Pharisees said unto Christ, Is it lawful to pay tribute unto Caesar? Christ said, Show me the tribute money. They brought him a penny, and he saith unto them, Whose is the image and the superscription? They said, Caesar's. And Christ said, Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Did Christ think that money belonged to Caesar because his image and superscription was stamped upon it? Did the penny belong to Caesar or to the man who had earned it? Had Caesar the right to demand it because it was adorned with his image? Does it appear from this conversation that Christ understood the real nature and use of money? Can we now say that Christ was the greatest of philosophers? You're listening to The Bill Ferguson Show. The Phil Ferguson Show is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Nothing said on the show should be interpreted as personalized investment advice. Investments should be based on your personal situation, and you, of course, should consult with your financial advisor or tax professional before taking any actions. This segment comes from a listener email. It is about lottery winnings, having a bad advisor, viaticals, annuities, good fun stuff like that. It's based on a article from the Wall Street Journal. And it is about Paul and Sue Rosenau. I think that's how you pronounce the name. I don't honestly know. But they won $180 million in the Powerball. And they decided instead of waiting over time to collect the $180 million, to take the winnings in one lump sum, which I think was somewhere $80 plus million. I don't know if this is the right choice for them, but I'm leaning towards it wasn't. But, but here, let me explain. If you get a great big winning like that and you don't have experience managing a large portfolio, there's a chance that 
it's not going to go well. There's a long known uh, piece of data that something like every lottery winner that wins a million dollars or more files bankruptcy or 80% of them file bankruptcy within five years. When I say within five years, um, some of them are a year or two or three, it, it, but by five per, five years, 80% have filed bankruptcy. It is very, very difficult to comprehend those sizes of money for almost all people. A lot of people just don't get money. And this company, this couple was per, apparently perfectly happy with the money they were making working and lived a pretty good life and kind of stuck true to the fact they didn't really need this money. So they took the lump sum, might have been perfectly fine, but whatever, they had to pay taxes. Uh, and it ends up being uh, something much less, maybe 60 million, even though they took 80 million. And then they started giving away money to a hospital, to a church, to other charities, which, okay, good for them. I would not have done it that way. So first of all, unless you can convince me that you have the ability to manage the money, I would take it over time. And I would also give away money over time. Uh, you know, not 5 million in one go, but maybe 500,000 per year for 10 years to make sure you have the ability to manage the money and you could always stop giving away money if things go against you. So it's hard to get money back. <laughs> I mean, impossible to get money back. Uh, so those are some things that I would think about. The The next thing that they did, apparently they put something like 26 million. And I don't know how much these guys kept for themselves. It doesn't sound like a whole lot, maybe a couple of million. I'm just guessing. It doesn't say. But they put $26 million in and created a research foundation for a specific illness that uh, they had a granddaughter that died from. And so, wow, how cool is that? I mean, these guys are great. They're, they're giving away millions and millions of dollars and keeping very, very little for themselves. So kudos to them being wonderful people that want to make a difference. That foundation, then, they took it to uh, Principal Securities. Uh, part of the principal financial group to manage. And it just so happened that the advisor there, to my understanding, was not uh, an RIA, uh, principal, a broker, broker dealer, so they're not a registered investment advisor. The manager, the person managing their account is an insurance salesperson, not an investment advisor representative, not a fiduciary. So he was free to sell all kinds of products that one could argue, I think very safely, was not in the best interest of this couple or the foundation or the people that needed this money for medical research, but it was good for the company and good for the salesperson. And this is one of those things that I obviously, I have problems with the salesperson and we're going to get into that in, in a minute, but it's the company that created the scenario, created the situation that the salesperson found themselves in. I blame them as well. Absolutely. Uh, within a few months, apparently this guy had put uh, 18.9 million of the 26 million into variable annuities for the foundation, earning $1.2 million in commission. So there was a scenario set up where he could do this all legal like and make $1.2 million in commissions. I mean, what's the guy supposed to do? Walk away from commissions? This is implicitly or explicitly what the company wants you to do. That's why they make these products. That's why they pay these high commissions. They want you to do it. So the commissions had fees of 2% or more. They also paid commissions of 6% or more, which just matches the math of that calculation, why this guy is making all these commissions. And it took him a couple of years, apparently, to get it all in these annuities, which I don't know why it took more than a few months, but then another interesting thing happened is that the advisor, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, air quotes, advisor, uh, after a few years started to sell the annuities, take out the cash and then buy new annuities. And you might think to yourself, why would they do that? Well, it's money, right? Uh, once you put somebody in an annuity, you might get a five, 10, maybe 15% commission. And you might have trailing commissions but that are pretty small relative to that, but you're done. But if you take the money out of an annuity, whether there's a penalty or not, that's a whole nother 
problem for the investor, but you reinvest it in a new annuity, a commission is paid again. And so this guy ended up buying $47 million in annuities because he was buying and then selling and then buying again, racking up at least $3.3 million in commissions. And at some point, the, uh, the husband of the, of the couple contacted this advisor and said, Hey, I, I want to break down of all the expenses and everything that's being paid. And apparently the advisor came back with, uh, something like there's, there's no, there's no fees. And so it becomes kind of a semantics thing. And what does it mean to be a fee? You know, there's, there's not a, a fee that they pay to the advisor. However, they invest the money, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. They buy an annuity, they buy a product and the insurance company pays a commission. So it, is that not a fee, but the money is still leaving your hands and your control and going to the advisor, the salesperson. So semantics aside, this guy's making millions of dollars off this charity, trying to save people's lives, which is, you know, dubious to begin with. The uh, other thing that they did, that this guy did is that there was a $3 million life insurance policy on the wife who ended up getting cancer and had a very short life expectancy. And so he sold this $3 million life insurance policy for $1.46 million. This gets into a concept called viaticals and a viatical is the name for when someone buys a life insurance policy that you already own, but you need the money now, not after you die. And it can be anything. Let's say you have a, well, in this case, a $3 million life insurance policy. You have to keep paying the premiums on the life insurance policy, unless it was all paid in full. Assuming it was all paid in full and it's $3 million whenever you die. Cool. Well, if you don't want to wait, if you need the money, if you don't want it to go to your kids or some other purpose, but in this case, the life insurance policy was bought inside of the foundation's account. The foundation has no urgency or need for this money. It turns out that she died maybe a year after her life insurance policy was sold for 1.46 million, but the policy was worth 3 million. So whoever bought the life insurance policy collected 3 million. Now, I don't have any information in this article about whether the uh, a salesman got a cut of that, but I wouldn't be surprised because it's, it, that's why he did it. Because otherwise it's just a, re, a really bad uh, financial decision. So this account, this foundation kept treading water and it was estimated over a six year time period where the stock market doubled, this account increased almost nothing. At some point, the foundation and uh, the husband because the wife passed away, sued uh, principal and this individual advisor for millions and millions of dollars. They just won. And that's why this article is in the Wall Street Journal. They just won 7.3 million. I had it here somewhere, but I think it's around that ballpark. Yes, $7.3 million in damages, which goes back to the foundation for more research. So that's fantastic. The problem is that between 2008 and 2024, what are we going to call that? That's 16 years, 16 years principal had all of this money and they probably invested it through whatever investments they chose to use. And it's a, probably a balance of stocks and bonds and some other things, normal investments. They don't buy their own annuities. So they took that $22 million and over those 14, 16, 16 years, the money easily doubled once, maybe 150% up in that time, but the account made next to nothing. So here is a situation where the insurance company made radically more from your money than you made from your money, than, than this foundation made from its own money. And the settlement of $7 million doesn't cover the lost opportunity of the investments. And, you know, how does one calculate the, the opportunity of these investments? I, I think a very conservative calculation is that they could have put all this money in a moderate mix of, uh, you know, half stocks, half bonds, and 
made something like five or six percent per year, but instead the foundation made next to nothing. So they, uh, the insurance company does have to cough up $7.3 million as a penalty, but how much did they make on that money? I don't, I don't know, but it's probably at least as much as was put in maybe 50% more. So something like 26 to $40 million and their penalty is $7 million. This, this is not a, even a slap on the wrist for the insurance company because if they've made $40 million, let's say they even made $30 million only. If they have to now pay $7 million of that, that means they kept $23 million. They made $23 million on someone else's money through high fees, commissions, transactions. Oh, of course, they are out the $3.3 million that they paid the salesperson. So uh, $30 million minus 7 minus 10 They only made $20 million. But they made $20 million on money that was not even theirs. This is not fair. This is not reasonable. This is legal. All of it's legal, but it should not be allowed. Advisors should not be able to, or insurance salespeople, should not be able to recommend and provide and put your money into assets or products, I like to call them, where the company makes dramatically more money than you do. And so when people wonder why I don't like annuities, here is this as an example. I will go on record saying that there is the theoretical possibility that some annuity is right for one specific client here and there. I've just never found that situation. The closest I got uh, uh, several years ago, I went to a, I don't know, an educational meeting, free meal, free alcohol kind of thing where annuities were presented. And I went to see, you know, maybe I'm missing something, but it was the same old stuff. That's cool. And there was a person there that worked for an annuity brokerage firm and you could buy or get through this annuity brokerage firm, you know, for a cut of the action, uh, they would help you find, you know, 50, 60, a hundred different annuities that you could choose. You could pick the best. And I wasn't very interested in it. The person, the, the lady that worked for this company, she says, uh, what percentage of your business is annuities? And I said, I don't do annuities. She goes, what does that mean that you don't do annuities? Everyone does annuities. And I said, I don't. And she said, why? And I said, because I can do math. She didn't really like that answer. But then I made her an offer. I said, I tell you what, let's say you've got a hundred annuities that you can help me use, that you can sell, that you can help me sell to a client, whether it's in their interest or not. Pick the best one. Pick whatever annuity you want out of the hundred and then create a theoretical scenario of, of someone who would benefit from that annuity. They can be single or married. They can be young or old. They can have kids or not kids. They can have a farmland or a business or nothing. Uh, they could have won the lottery in this case or, or not. And, and you create all the parameters and you create the annuity and then you send me all the information, the theoretical customer. Uh, and the annuity and all the fees and the expenses and every single detail you can possibly send me. And I will read every fucking word. I will spend 40 hours researching the scenario you gave me, but I will then be using that information to do a segment on my podcast. If it works out that it's, that I think that it's a good investment, I'll say so. If it doesn't work out, I'm going to say so. And her response was, well, if you're not going to take this serious, Seriously, I guess seriously. And I thought, and I even said, what do you mean not take it seriously? I doubt anyone has offered to spend as much time on something like this than I'm just offering. Because I, for me, it wasn't about making a commission, which I don't make any commissions. For me, it's always about finding what's the best for the client. And it's a pretty high fucking bar you got to get over with me. And part of that is because I get paid a percentage. So I want your account to get bigger and bigger over time because I want my fee to be bigger and bigger over time, right? So we have the same objective. We have the same goal, your account to be bigger in the future. So th it's a problem with commissions because someone who sells on a commission gets money and then nothing else. They get it right up front. Well, they've got to sell something. They got to sell a new person. Or in this case, they have to sell products they already sold you a few years after they sold them to you and then re resell them again have you buy another brand new annuity and all of that churns your account, creates expenses, creates taxes, possibly not in this case, it's a foundation. 
um, but it destroys the possibility of you having long-term slow and steady gains. Uh, recently talked to somebody that was talking to an advisor that says they're a flat fee. And this person is now investigating that. And I'm waiting to see if they give me some results. I said, that's fantastic. A flat fee sounds nice. And I'm assuming for a large account, the flat fee is less than what I would charge. But why are they doing work for a whole lot less than me? Maybe it works. Maybe that's a good model. But I'm betting that there's a flat fee for being the advisor. And then there's other fees for other stuff. I previously, maybe six months ago, went and got a free steak dinner. You guys might remember that. And there you can get all kinds of perks and prizes. And uh, the guy who does the investing is up to 1.25% where mine is 1% or less. But then he also charges the clients. The clients pay additionally for the asset manager or for the, what they call the money manager. So the person that actually does the investing for your portfolio is not part of their firm. And that's all stuff that I do. It's tedious. I like doing it, thankfully for me. Uh, it's great fun. And I can hopefully look at it objectively and try to figure out how to maximize the portfolio. And it can be kind of easier for me to do that because it's not my money, it's your money. And so the goal is to have a reasonably good return at a reasonably good risk profile. Uh, but they would send it to a money manager that wants another 0.2 or 0.5% and the client pays that. So you, you could pay 1.25 plus another half. So 1.75% expense every year. And if you talk to somebody that has a flat fee, are they recommending mutual funds that then pay them 1%? So you're not paying them the 1%, you're paying the flat fee, but the 1% comes out of the mutual fund. And you might say, well, that's okay. The mutual fund's paying it. Well, well, where does the mutual fund get money? They get money from your account, right? I mean, the money doesn't show up in th out of thin air. You're paying for everything. You always pay for everything. So when something looks really cheap or even worse, looks free, look out because nothing's free. Nobody's doing this work on a volunteer basis, at least nobody that I know of. Uh, so when things look a lot cheaper or more affordable, how are they doing it? What are they cutting? What are they hiding? What are they manipulating? And maybe it's a flat fee, but they say, oh, you should put a million dollars in an annuity where they make a 10% commission. So they make a hundred thousand where someone like Phil's making 10, they're making a hundred thousand and they're making a lot more money. So they don't need to charge you a percentage. Anyway, I'm rambling on the net result for this company, this couple that won $180 million dollars is they gave away a whole bunch of it. They put some in a foundation and good for them. And they got screwed. They, they lost. And the settlement said that they weren't do anything for the growth revenue potential that they could have made. They, they should have made because if they put 26 million in 08 at near the end of the 09, 08 uh, market correction, pretty big market correction to now, um, I think it'd be pretty easy to say that that money should have tripled. I'd have to check the math, but it should have at least doubled and it didn't. And the insurance company and the insurance salesman made that money and the investors didn't. Okay. I'm cool. I'm cool. Let's take a little break and we'll go on to some more fun stuff. You're listening to The Phil Ferguson Show. Section 9. Is Christ our example? He never said a word in favor of education. He never even hinted at the existence of any science. He never uttered a word in favor of industry, economy, or of any effort to better our condition in this world. He was the enemy of the successful, of the wealthy. Dives was sent to hell, not because he was bad, but because he was rich. Lazarus went to heaven, not because he was good, but because he was poor. Christ cared nothing for painting, for sculpture, for music, nothing for any art. He said nothing about the duties of nation to nation, of king to subject, nothing about the rights of man, nothing about intellectual liberty or the freedom of speech. He said nothing about the sacredness of home, not one word for the fireside, not a word in favor of marriage, in honor of maternity. He never married. 
He wandered homeless from place to place with a few disciples. None of them seemed to have been engaged in any useful business, and they seemed to have lived on arms. All human ties were held in contempt. This world was sacrificed for the next. All human effort was discouraged. God would support and protect. At last, in the dusk of death, Christ, finding that he was mistaken, cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? We have found that man must depend on himself. He must clear the land. He must build the home. He must plow and plant. He must invent. He must work with hand and brain. He must overcome the difficulties and obstructions. He must conquer and enslave the forces of nature to the end that they may do the work of the world. The Phil Ferguson Show is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Nothing said on the show should be interpreted as personalized investment advice. Investments should be based on your personal situation, and you, of course, should consult with your financial advisor or tax professional before taking any actions. I want to take a moment and talk about long-term capital gains. Now, for Some listeners and even some of my clients that have the vast majority or all of their portfolio in IRAs, Roth IRAs, or 401ks or other work-related plans, Uh, I I mention those because the rule still applies, but this is not investment advice. This is definitely not personalized investment advice on what you should do with those work-related plans, a la the Department of Labor rule, which I've talked about multiple times. Anywho, so if you have tax deferred accounts, this doesn't apply. This applies to taxable accounts. So you have an individual account, you have a brokerage account, you have a taxable account, you have a joint account, uh, the account type of accounts that have been around forever, long before uh, IRAs and Roth IRAs were a thing. You can still open one of these accounts today. I didn't want to uh, have anyone think that because they've been around, it's it's not a it's not a new thing or it's not a current thing. So if you are just starting and for whatever reason don't qualify for an IRA or a Roth IRA, or you want to save more money than the IRA or Roth IRA limits, you put it into a taxable account. If it's just you, your name only on the account, that's an individual account. If it's you and another person with a few state exceptions, it's going to be a joint tenants account. And that means those two people own 100% of the money individually and collectively nice thing about that, uh, sometimes called the transfer on death account. If one person dies, it's just still the other person's money, 100% straight up. No no process is needed. Uh, you just deliver them a death certificate so that the, they take the other person's name off, but it's your money. In one of those types of accounts, a conventional, a brokerage, a taxable, joint individual account, you are subject to not only taxes on income that comes from that account from stock and bond dividends, but you will likely have to pay tax on capital gains. If you do not buy or sell anything during a given calendar year, you will have very little to no capital gains. There is a possibility that you will have capital gains because the fund, the mutual fund, or the index fund, which is a subset type of a mutual fund, has transactional activity within inside of that fund. All of that information will be provided to you at the end of the calendar year when tax season comes around in a form called the 1099-DIV for dividends, I think. And it will show realized capital gains, It will show dividends. It will break out the dividends that are qualified or non-qualified. Just for fun, qualified dividends, usually from bonds and from mutual funds, uh, stock mutual funds and stocks uh, from everywhere. So the dividends will often most likely be qualified, which means they're qualified for special tax treatment. It's been a change in the system over the years where now most dividends for most people are not taxed at your income, earned income tax rate. They're taxed at the lower capital gains tax rate. Why? Because that's how wealthy people make money. So once again, P 
people that have high income, if the income is from stock dividends or bond yields, bond dividends, they're paying a lower tax rate than someone who works for a living. I know it's bullshit, but that's the rules. Talk to your senator or congressman. Long-term capital gains tax rates. The basic gist is that there's three, but really four and maybe even five tiers. But for almost everybody, it's going to be the first or second tier. Let me explain. So the first tier is 0%, which is pretty cool. So if you are single, you can pay a long-term capital gains tax rate of 0% on up to $47,000. I think, and warning, I am not a tax professional, but your long-term capital gains tax tier rate is based on the combination of your long-term capital gains and your income for that calendar year, not just necessarily your long-term capital gains. So if your income and long-term capital gains is below 47,000 and you're a single person filing taxes singly, if you had 30,000 of long-term capital gains and 17,000 of in earned income, your total is 47,000, the tax rate that you would pay on your long-term gains is zero. This is very important because I have some clients that for some reasons or sometimes will have very low income. And if they have very low income, you can actually sell and have realized capital gains and your tax rate that applies to those is zero. By the way, that cutoff for a married couple filing jointly is $94,000. So if you're in retirement or you don't work this year for whatever reason, you only make 30 or 40,000 and you can get by, you might want to think about selling enough stuff in your taxable portfolio to have 20, 30, 40, 50,000 in realized capital gains because your tax rate might be zero. Please check with your tax professional before taking any actions. So there's that. Above the 0% is 15%. For an individual person, that caps out at 518,900, calendar year 2024. For married filing jointly, it's slightly higher, $583,750. I am under the impression that the vast majority of my listeners are not going to go above the 15% tier. Again, 519,000 or 584,000 around it. So as long as your realized capital gains and your earned income and other income is below that 500,000 number, you're going to pay 15% on capital gains. So let me give a specific numerical example. You buy something for 30,000. And 10 years later, it's worth 100000 Congratulations. You've done well. You put in 30000 It's now worth 100000 If it's in a taxable account and you don't sell it, it, it will show somewhere in the account, and Schwab does this. Most every company will do this. They'll show you the unrealized capital gains. And in that scenario, you bought thirty. You have hundred. Your unrealized capital gains is $70,000. Under current law in the United States, you owe no tax on that 70000 It is an unrealized gain. If you sell that investment in its entirety, the $100,000, you now have 100000 in cash. You bought that investment for 30000 You now have a $70,000 realized long-term capital gain. And by long-term, you have to own it for a year and a day. There used to be other tiers where you had to own it for three or five years to get um, the more favorable treatment. And maybe we'll have that again someday. And maybe long-term capital gains will increase it someday to be equal to income tax like they were in the past. I don't know, but I, I can only work with what I have now. And so if you think that at some point in the future, the government is going to increase long-term capital gains tax rates, one could make an argument 
then it would be very beneficial for your total portfolio or your estate to sell things now, or at least some of them, especially if you qualify for the 0% capital gains tax rate. You got to do that. But if you qualify for the 15% and you have the $70,000 in gain that we just talked about on top of your income, as long as you're below these 500,000 really rich person, high income numbers, you're going to pay 15% capital gains tax. Now, other people will argue, but if I don't sell it, I don't have to pay any capital gains tax. Again, under current law, that is perfectly true. However, you will eventually, unless the laws change, you will eventually have to pay capital gains on all of the realized gains at some point in the future when you sell those positions and you realize those long-term gains. The only real practical way to avoid that, I guess two, one, you could give the money away to a charity and then the charity sells it and they have no gain or they have a gain, but their tax rate is zero because they're a charity. Or the less optimal choice is you could die. When you die and give that money to your heirs, your descendants, your spouse, your children, not your spouse, your children, they get a thing that's called a a step-up basis for millions and millions of dollars. And again, for most listeners, you're going to be covered by this in total. If your descendants get this money, the day of your death, they get that current valuation and they only have to pay taxes on gains and or dividends that happen after the date of your death, which is pretty cool. And again, It's another one of those things that helps out wealthy people, people that have millions of dollars, millions and millions, not 50 million or 100 million, but, you know, 10 million, 12 million, 15 million. They can pass that on to their descendants and the descendants get that step up basis and pay no tax. So you might not want to realize the capital gains because there's that. Um, What comes up occasionally for me is if if I rebalance an account and I recommend that you pay attention to rebalancing yourself, if you have 500,000 in a taxable account and 500,000 in an IRA, if you can do the rebalancing in the IRA, that's probably where you want to do it. Sometimes I have clients that have the vast majority or even all of their money in a taxable account. So when you do rebalancing, and an inherent in rebalancing is reducing the amount of money you have in the things that have done the best and increasing the amount of money in the things that have not done the best. That's how rebalancing works. If you rebalance in a taxable account, you might probably will create a long-term tax liability because you've now realized those gains. Keeping in mind, for example, if you have one position that's $100,000 too big and you want to sell $100,000 of it, and that's going to create $50,000 of long-term capital gains, if your tax rate is 15%, that's going to be $7,500 in taxes. And this is where it can get really interesting for people, particularly if an account has been so far for years rebalanced with new money. So someone that's adding 20, 30, 40, $50,000 a year. Or if your scale is much smaller, you know, you have a hundred thousand portfolio and you're adding three or 4,000 per year. Sometimes the rebalancing can be done mostly or even a hundred percent within either IRAs or with new incoming money. So the things that have underperformed, that's where the new cash goes. Sometimes when the account gets bigger, at least in relationship to the amount of money you're adding, or if you have most of your portfolio in a taxable account, or if there's been a really big change, you're going to have to rebalance by selling some part of the things that have gone up above everything else. And it's going to create capital gains. So again, the example I had, you sell a hundred thousand you paid 50,000 for it. The gains are 50,000. Your tax rate is 15% on the 50,000, which is $7,500 in taxes. If that person is still working or, or even worse, if they're in retirement 
and they're living on fifty, sixty thousand dollars a year. Maybe some out of their account, maybe some on social security, maybe a pension, other sources of income. A sudden tax bill of seven thousand five hundred dollars seems like a fortune, and it's real money. And then they go, "Oh my God, do we really, Phil? Do we really want to do this?" Well, if you believe in rebalancing, yes, because again, like I said earlier, that capital gains tax rate, at some point, you will have to pay it or give away the investment or die. So as long as you're living, you're going to pay that capital gains tax. So why not do it when things are out of whack and you need to rebalance? Otherwise, you're not rebalancing and rebalancing has value. And again, in this example of selling $100,000 and then redistributing it somewhere else might create a tax bill of $7,500. If that position, which has been particularly hot for the last year or two, reverts and goes back down to a more reasonable number or starts to suffer from underperformance, if that 100000 underperforms by 10%, you could lose $10,000 while saving yourself the $7,500 in taxes by not rebalancing. I hope that makes sense because it's one of those things, it's a scale thing that you've been saving for 5, 10, 20, 30, 40 years. And all of a sudden your portfolio seems like out of nowhere got to be big. And that's pretty fucking cool, by the way. But it means adult decisions have to be made. You might have to sell something for $100,000 and have a $7,500 tax bill. And you're going to wonder where the fuck is $7,500 coming from because that still seems like a ridiculously large amount of money to you. One way to do it is if you sell something that's worth $100,000, reinvest $92,500 in other places and leave $7,500 in cash so you can pay the tax bill. People don't like that answer. But that's a pretty good way to do it if you can't do it out of cash flow. And this is part of that uh, financial dysphoria, which is a wonderful thing to have kind of in a way. But you might still be making 50000 or or 100000 a year and your portfolio is now worth a million or two million or more. And I've had people that have even larger accounts where we have to talk about a thirty or forty or fifty thousand dollar tax liability. You should be so fucking lucky, right? That means you've done really, really well. Which, ironically, leads me to the another thought is that sometimes people go, "Okay, well, can we sell some of the losers to offset the gains?" Well, if you're buying individual stocks, you probably have lots of losers to sell. But if you're doing index funds, and one of the reasons to do index funds especially if you've held them for several years and you're not in the middle of a big market correction, it is very possible that none of your index funds are really materially down anything. And of course, the ones that are underperforming, that's where you want to add the money to. You could sell them and buy something different as long as you don't violate the tax uh, wash sale rules. But if almost nothing is down a large amount, you just can't do it. Again, it sucks that almost everything in your portfolio went up, deal with it, pay the 15% tax, do the rebalance, et cetera. Now, if you're over those limits that I talked about before, the 500 plus thousand dollars, you might go into the 20% capital gains tax bracket. For most people, it might be best to avoid paying that 20% because you can pay the 15%. And then wait, hopefully, a few more months or until next year, and then rebalance again. You know, spread it out over two times to make sure you're only paying 15%, not 20%. In addition to the 20%, there's an additional 3.8% that you might have to pay in taxes, which are technically not capital gains taxes, but you might have to pay, I I think it goes to cover. Medicare, Medicaid, um, I think it's 3.8%. I'll have to double check. I haven't dug into it because I try to avoid getting to the 20% for most clients anyway, but you might have this additional 3.8%. And of course, if your total combined income and capital gains are high enough, you might lose out on some other benefits, some other weird things in the tax code that you 
you might have been able to deduct or reduce your taxes that you are now not able to reduce your taxes. Nothing specific comes to mind. That one example I'll have is that if you want to buy a brand new EV, assuming that specific car meets the criteria, you get a $7,500 tax credit. Well, first of all, you have to have taxes in that calendar year to have the credit apply to it or you lose it. So people with really low incomes don't get it, which is stupid. Uh, but it, there's also another rule that if you make above a certain amount of income, you don't get it. So there's all kinds of things like that that can affect your income taxes. So of course, you might want to check with your tax professional before doing anything big and dramatic. But that is one of the things that slows down my ability to make the adjustments when I decide to make adjustments beyond simple rebalancing because I'm going to recommend that the client that I'm talking to, that they do talk to their tax professional. And this is a great time of the year to do it. You don't necessarily want to be having these conversations or trying to have these conversations in March or the first couple of weeks of April with your tax professional because they're trying to get everyone's taxes filed in the next few days or few weeks or month or whatever. So things to think about, you know, when do you rebalance? How much do you want to rebalance? Keep an eye on those taxable accounts. You might have tax consequences. What are those tax consequences? There's a lot of little details and that's what slows me down. And that's why I don't like an automated process because I guess I could subscribe or pay for some service and just hit a button and all 130 of my clients' accounts would adjust. Oh, that sounds kind of spooky and scary to me, but there's plenty of services out there that offer that uh, as a way to do it more efficiently and probably cheaper than what I'm doing. Uh, but sometimes those little details matter and, and the way that you do it matter because as an example, someone might have, I need to sell 100000 to rebalance and they're going to have $60,000 in long-term gains. And they say, oh, by the way, I'm going to add $200,000 to the account that came from X source in a few months. Oh, well, shit, I'm not going to rebalance now. I'll wait for the new money to come in and that will all go in the things that have been lagging behind. It's kind of a, a contrarian philosophy. Anyway, I didn't think I'd talk about this little thing. <laughs> for 20 plus minutes, but here we are. So that's some thoughts on long-term gains, uh, long-term gains, uh, tax rates and how it affects your portfolio and portfolio rebalancing. And if I just made it more confusing, uh, email me phil at Polaris financial planning.com. And maybe I can go over some details or examples for you if that's helpful, but we'll take a break and go on with the rest of the show. Thank you so much for listening to the Phil Ferguson show. I greatly appreciate it. If you like the show, you can go leave a five-star review somewhere. The only two that I know about are Apple podcasts and Stitcher. It is greatly appreciated because when someone stumbles across the show, they might say, well, who is this guy? And they go look and they see hundreds of five-star reviews. They're more likely to listen. So I appreciate that effort if you can make it. Of course, I've teased, and this is again, another tease that I'm in the midst of rebalancing um, my model just a little bit. It's not anything dramatic and huge. So no need to send me emails asking what I've done because I'm not done rolling it out to all of my clients. Got a large part of it done. Uh, now the big challenge is for clients that have taxable accounts where the rebalance needs to take a pl take place, which is why I had the whole segment because it was in the top of my head and I've had conversations with people and uh, rebalancing and paying long-term capital gains on things that have gone up uh, is a nice place to be. It's uh, it's better than losing money, right? It, it's also one of those weird things. Sometimes people will contact me and they've done investing somewhere else that uh, they, they call me and they say, Phil, I'd, I'd like some losses. Can you sell some things? If they've been using index funds for a while, there may not be that many losses. So that's one of the reasons for that broad diversified index funds is that uh, they have a lot of things. And if you own them long enough, your big biggest problem might be that you don't have any losses. So bummer for you, right? Uh, that's a good problem to have. I think that's about it. I'm going to be doing some traveling and, oh, I'm, uh, so the next show might be the full 10 to 14 days from now, 
when, when you get to hear that. Also, I think I will soon, maybe the next episode, maybe the one after that, start the process of the six segments that I've done a couple of times. The last time was, I think, about two years ago, where I go over the Polaris plan from kind of beginning to end. And that, of course, will incorporate the tweaks that I've made so you can get all of that. But like I said, I got to roll that out to all the clients or almost all the clients before I put it on the show. But I've had a lot of people saying, yeah, you, you sure you did that two years ago, but what's changed? What's your thoughts now? So I'll probably redo that uh, six shows over, over six episodes, not six weeks, but where at least ep- uh, every episode I'll talk about the plan, what it does, what it doesn't do, how it works, the general philosophy of it. And it's a very, very important part of the show. It's the, if you read the four books that I recommend, and if you understand those six episodes, probably it will be again, six episodes of how the plan works. Uh, maybe you won't beat everybody, but you're going to beat a lot of people. You're going to beat 90, 95% of other investors. I think maybe I don't have any statistics on that. Uh, the whole idea is to have reasonably good returns with a reasonably moderate amount of risk. So we don't want to do anything too crazy. We're not rolling the dice. We're not throwing darts at the board. And of course, I'm just prattling on here. So I'm going to wrap up. I'm going to enjoy Baja Khan. If you're there, please come and say hello. And I will hope to see you somewhere out there on the road sometime soon. Until then, ciao. Section 10. Why should we place Christ at the top and summit of the human race? Was he kinder, more forgiving, more self-sacrificing than Buddha? Was he wiser? Did he meet death with more perfect calmness than Socrates? Was he more patient, more charitable than Epictetus? Was he a greater philosopher, a deeper thinker than Epicurus? In what respect was he superior of Zoroaster? Was he gentler than Lao Tzu? more universal than Confucius? Were his ideas of human rights and duty superior to those of Zeno? Did he express grander truth than Cicero? Was his mind subtler than Spinoza's? Was his brain equal to Kepler's or Newton's? Was he grander in death, a sublimer martyr than Bruno? Was he in intelligence, in the force and beauty of expression, in breadth and scope of thought, in wealth of illustration, in aptness of comparison, in knowledge of the human brain and heart, of all the passions, hopes, and fears, the equal of Shakespeare, the greatest of the human race. If Christ was in fact God, he knew all the future. Before him, like a panorama, moved the history yet to be. He knew how his words would be interpreted. He knew what crimes, what horrors, what infamies would be committed in his name. He knew that the hungry flames of persecution would climb around the limbs of countless martyrs. He knew that thousands and thousands of brave men and women would languish in dungeons and darkness filled with pain. He knew that his church would invent and use instruments of torture, that his followers would appeal to whip and faggot to chain and rack. He saw the horizon of the future lurid with the flames of the auto de fe, He knew what creeds would spring like poisonous fungi from every text. He saw the ignorant sects waging war against each other. He saw thousands of men under the orders of priests building prisons for their fellow men. He saw thousands of scaffolds dripping with the best and bravest blood. He saw his followers using the instruments of pain. He heard the groans, saw the faces white with agony. He heard the shrieks and sobs and cries of all the moaning, martyred multitudes. He knew that commentaries would be written on his words with swords to be read by the light of faggots. He knew that the Inquisition would be born of the teachings attributed to him. He saw the interpolations and falsehoods that hypocrisy would write and tell. 
He saw all wars that would be waged, and he knew that above these fields of death, these dungeons, these rackings, these burnings, these executions, for a thousand years would float the dripping banner of the cross. He knew that hypocrisy would be robed and crowned, that cruelty and credulity would rule the world, knew that liberty would perish from the earth, knew that popes and kings in his name would enslave the souls and bodies of men, knew that they would persecute and destroy the discoverers, thinkers, and inventors, knew that his church would extinguish reason's holy light and leave the world without a star. He saw his disciples extinguishing the eyes of men, flaying them alive, cutting out their tongues, searching for all the nerves of pain. He knew that in his name his followers would trade in human flesh, that cradles would be robbed, and women's breasts unbabed for gold. And yet he died with voiceless lips. Why did he fail to speak? Why did he not tell his disciples and through them the world, You shall not burn, imprison, and torture in my name. You shall not persecute your fellow men. Why did he not plainly say, I am the Son of God, or I am God? Why did he not explain the Trinity? Why did he not tell the mode of baptism that was pleasing to him? Why did he not write a creed? Why did he not break the chains of slaves? Why did he not say that the Old Testament was or was not the inspired word of God? Why did he not write the New Testament himself? Why did he leave his words to ignorance, hypocrisy, and chance? Why did he not say something positive, definite, and satisfactory about another world? Why did he not turn the tear-stained hope of heaven into the glad knowledge of another life? Why did he not tell us something of the rights of man, of the liberty of hand and brain? Why did he go dumbly to his death, leaving the world to misery and to doubt? I will tell you why. He was a man and did not know.'